Well, good morning. I'm so glad you're here. I know several people are out of town. In fact, some are watching online. So if you're watching us and you're on vacation this week and you didn't invite us on your vacation, shame on you. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I actually did get to go on vacation and spend some time with family. I have some family here with me this morning. And uh, so I will be preaching both in English and Portuguese at the same time because they're here from Brazil. Um, we, uh, we actually had a good time over the holidays. I hope you did too, celebrating the freedoms that we enjoy in this country and the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. I hope you got to spend some good time with family and friends like I did. By the way, isn't it wonderful to celebrate baptism through new birth? I mean, God is so good. What a wonderful testimony. So excited for Jamie. Now, today we'll continue our journey through the book of Revelation. Our current series is titled Unveiled. It comes from the very first word of the book, a revelation, the word apocalypsis or apocalypsis, which is where we get the word apocalypse for, from or apocalyptic. So you're familiar at least with that. Now throughout this series, we are offering a uh, Bible study on Wednesday nights for those who want to go deeper. It will happen this Wednesday. So go ahead and do that. Again, this is busy travel month. Again, if you're watching online and if you're traveling this week, you can go on our website under Wednesday night. Click on there and then you'll find a link to the tab that will give you the recorded teaching sessions. Now the word apocalypsis or apocalypsis in the Greek denotes the idea of uncovering or uh, of, of laying something to bear or revealing as if taking a veil off of something. Hence the title for this series as Unveiled. But as I have been saying, I will continue to say, what's most important about the book of Revelation is not what it reveals, but rather who it reveals. The book is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. That's the very first phrase of the book, Jesus the Messiah. And it is Jesus himself that speaks to the seven churches in Revelation, in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. And today we will look at what Christ has said to the churches in Revelation chapter 3. So if you have a copy of God's word, please go ahead and open it to Revelation chapter 3. And we will begin to read it in just a moment. Throughout this series, we are encouraging people to memorize uh, the Word of God, especially from the book of Revelation. This past week's memory verse is an invitation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself to all of us, especially to those who will repent of their sin and complacency toward Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I mean, how beautiful is that, right? If anyone hears my voice, I will come in to him and I will eat with him and he with me. Now, next week's memory verse is from the book of Revelation chapter 4. In verse 11, we will look at what the things that will come. That is the next portion of the book of Revelation that will lead us all the way to the end. And it's a highlight reel of what will happen at the very end of the age. And listen to what it says, Revelation 4, 11, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your your will, they existed and were created. And those are words to Jesus Christ himself. Beautiful words. Let's say them together as the people of God. This is in the screen behind me. Would you please follow with me as we recite this out loud? Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things And by your will, they existed and were created. Revelation 4.11. Now, I know several of you have fought and have won against cancer. Meanwhile, quite a few folks from our church family are battling cancer. Cancer is a terrible disease. Its effects on the human body are devastating. Pastor Tony Evans once compared the effects of cancer as a metaphor for unhealth in the body of Christ. And he said this, cancer is one of the most debilitating diseases of our day. Do you know what cancer is? You see, there are cells that don't want to go with the program. They are deviant cells that have their own agenda. 
Cancer cells still want blood. They still want to eat. They still want oxygen because they want to grow. Not only do they want to grow, but they also want to spread and metastasize. So in other words, they want to siphon off the body, but they don't want to contribute to it. And ultimately, unless addressed radically, the whole body is in trouble. Cancer exists in the church today too, he says. There are cells of people that want the benefits of being in the body without the contributions. They want the sermons. They want the songs. They want the, to be ministered to. They want great ministry to their kids and the church meals through fellowships. And they want the counseling that is offered for their problems. They want all the things that the body is designed to give. But they don't want to be part of the body. They just want to hang out in it. You see, many of the churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 had a spiritual cancer problem. Members in those churches who were trying to sway others toward spiritual destruction and toward death. Groups of people infecting the body of Christ with their sin and unrepentance. The main difference, though, between physical and spiritual cancer is that the latter is a choice, isn't it? You choose to sin against Jesus and wreak havoc upon his body, the church. Human cancer is a terrible, awful, and devastating illness. Anyone who has or has had cancer would tell you it's terrible. Nobody chooses to have cancer. But sin, you see, fools us, and the devil does too, into thinking that spiritual cancer is not that bad. In fact, it sometimes fools us to thinking that sin is good for us, that sin is good, quote-unquote. And that's Satan's biggest lie to each of us. Like cancerous cells, some parts of the body of Christ were sick. So Jesus addressed the problem head on in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Thankfully, not all of the body was sick. For instance, one of the churches in Revelation chapter 3, which we will look at today, the church of Philadelphia, had nothing that Jesus spoke about. No spiritual cancer, so to speak, like the church of Smyrna in chapter 2. Though some were okay and are okay with spiritual cancer in the body, Jesus isn't. So he's going to speak to the church, and he does. So let's go to Revelation chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 1. I'll be reading from the ESV translation. This is the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis people who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy." The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name of the book of, out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about and patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven in my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen in self to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove in discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. There's a lot to unpack here. I won't cover everything, but I will try, as I promised uh, when I preach from Revelation chapter 2, to be as concise as I can. Now, keep in mind that the book of Revelation, as I have already told you, is mostly descriptive in nature. In other words, it describes things, what they are. But there are elements of it that are prescriptive. It tells you what to do, as you can tell from Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 now. Often. The prescription that Christ gives to us as his children comes in the form of repentance, doesn't it? Keep in mind that the corrections given to these ser- in these sermons in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are warnings for us. Like any sermon, Christ's words to the church should move us into transformation if we indeed hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Today's sermon title is also words to the church, which you can say these are also words to the church is. If you follow the text, you may notice at, beginning, at the beginning of each church address, we have the phrase, the words of, and then followed by a title, a description of Christ. That's where today's sermon title comes from, words to the church. All seven of the church's revelations were real churches. They existed at the same time of history, relatively close in proximity, geographically speaking, to each other. You may notice that each church is also different from each other. As I said last time, even today, there are churches in McKinney that are different from one another. There are churches perhaps here too that need correction. Some that may be like the church in Ephesus that have strict doctrine but are unloving. While another congregation nearby may actually now struggle with Some people in their church uh, being spokespersons for ungodly moral sexual conduct like the church at Thyatira or a lukewarm church as we read from today who is indifferent about the gospel and the Lord himself. Regardless, each church is unique because God made them unique. No one church is perfect. All churches have issues. Stick around long enough at Crosspoint and you'll find out. We ain't perfect. The question is, though, that we must ask, and I asked this last time, is when in error will you repent and turn to God? Or will you remain in your sin? Also, when sin is revealed, will you, will I, deal with others as Christ deals with us, with grace, with mercy? See, repentance is often the goal of a preacher that he has for his sermon. Sermons call people toward repentance and transformation. God certainly has called me to repentance a lot lately as I have dealt with pride and anger and frustration and different ways. You see, these are things that are common in the life of the believer. You must fight against it in the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you struggle with those things? With pride, anger, unrepentance. We're humans. That happens. But you see, we must not fight it on our own. We must fight it 
and the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who speaks to the churches. In fact, we are told that if we read Scripture that we will be blessed, the book of Revelation, not only that, that all Scripture, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3.16, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, the words breathe out are directly related to the work of the Holy Spirit for teaching, reproofing, correcting, and training in righteousness here. God's word to the church is only able to change us if we hear what it says to the churches. But as it is often the case, hearing is not listening. There's a difference. You can hear something be said. You can hear my words right now. You can hear the word of God being read out loud. But if you don't heed it, and change, nothing will happen. If you're a parent or a boss or a coach, you know what I'm talking about. You can say something, you can try to instruct, you can try to correct somebody, but if the person does not truly listen, they only hear your words, they will not change their course of action. We must truly listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's get into Revelation chapter 3 here. As I said a couple of weeks ago, when preaching through certain biblical genres, especially uh, this type of literature in Revelation, Extra work needs to be done to explain the symbolic nature of certain things. So I will do that. I will employ that same approach. Is that okay with you? Okay, to explain the text. Let's begin with the church as Sardis. First, we have a title for Christ. To the church as Sardis, here's what it says. And to the angel of the church as Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This first title to the church of Sardis includes a description of Christ's own relationship with the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit. This reference is a direct attestation as well as Christ, for Christ's roles as the Messianic King. I am reminded here of Christ's uh, quote of Isaiah chapter 61 uh, in, uh, that is actually referenced in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 where he states the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus is preaching to the churches here. You see Christ is the greatest preacher of all time. The reference to the seven spirits in Revelation 3.1 is an allusion to the Holy Spirit, which we have already determined from chapter 1. You can go back and listen to that sermon that I preached. In fact, the word Spirit of God, by the way, and Holy Spirit never appear in the book of Revelation. The word Spirit does, but never Spirit of God or Holy Spirit. And here, the Holy Spirit has a different description. He is described as seven spirits. It's hard to know why John used this reference, but if we actually look at the idea here, the idea likely has to do with the perfection of the work of the Holy Spirit upon the life of the believer, but also in redemptive history. I take on this interpretation because I believe John use, usually often uses the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And there we see a quote from Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 that says this. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Again, a messianic reference to Jesus. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and under, of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now more can be said, but let's look at the second title given here. The second title says that Jesus has the seven stars in his hand. This has to do with his authority over the church and also over all spiritual beings, including these angels, including, by the way, our church. The seven stars are angels of each of the churches. In other words, both the angels and the church or churches that Jesus spoke to serve him and fall under his authority. Though I don't know 100% if if Crosspoint has a guardian angel, it seems that the seven churches in Revelation indeed had one. Regardless, the second title is demonstrative of the fact that Jesus has authority over all spiritual beings in the church. Isn't it wonderful to know that Christ is completely sovereign? That should give you and I hope. If you're a Christ follower, this is a wonderful reality to hold on to. If you're not a Christ follower, you're the one that's missing out on these blessings. If Christ is in control of everything, that means everyone 
must submit under his authority. We're told that at the end of all things, every knee will bow before Jesus. But many choose not to. Do you? Or would you rather remain in your sin and rebellion and not serve him? You see, some people willingly choose to remain in their sin. Christ will not force you to love him. That's how loving he is and merciful. Now, Christ also has a title for himself that's given to the church of Philadelphia. Beautiful title. I have to unpack it because it's just, there's a lot here. Verse 7, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has a key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Let's begin with the first title. The first description to the church at Philadelphia is that Jesus is the Holy One. I mean, if you're a Jewish person reading this, immediately you're thinking, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He's the Holy One of Israel. This first title is a, reminder, is a reminder to the church at Philadelphia that Christ is God. You see, just the, the church of Philadelphia was a healthy church, just as the church in Smyrna. The church at Smyrna was, uh, was also a church that was encouraged by Jesus. There we're told that Jesus is the first and the last. In other, in other words, he's sovereign. He's an eternal God. You see, this title to the church of Philadelphia here is an assurance of Christ's sovereignty. To them. When persecuted or going through trials, we can find rest in the fact that God is sovereign. He is all knowing. I had to be reminded of that this week as my family and I went through some and walked through some difficult times together. God is always good, always sovereign. It's not just a slogan we say in church God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. That is indeed true. Do you believe that God works all things together for the good of those who love him? Do you believe that God knows and wants what's best for you, even though you might be going through trials in the present? Do you trust his plans for your life? You see, he's always in control. Let us not forget that. The Church of Philadelphia needed that reminder. Now the second title to the Church of Philadelphia is a reminder that some might try to illegitimize our faith, but we are secure in Christ. Some believers from what the, is known as the synagogue of Satan, also mentioned to the church at Smyrna, were persecuting God's people. And in fact, they were calling these believers at Philadelphia illegitimate by their actions. But you see, the point is that Christ is the official stamp to legitimize our faith. He's the one that tells us. And if you serve him, indeed you are a legitimate Christian. It is not religion that saves you. You see, all human-made religion is satanic. God is the key to true religion. Jesus himself is. Not what we come up with. Now, the third title to the church at Philadelphia is also one of legitimacy. And here, it's an interesting title. It says that he is the one who has the key of David. Now, this is, I have to unpack this because we may not be familiar with this. Now, this title is understood in light of the next title, by the way, that says that Jesus is the one who opens and no one will what? Shut. And who shuts and no one will what? Open. In the Old Testament, the master of the palace held the key to the king's palace. By the way, in the ancient world, keys were very large. People didn't have little keys like we do. The keys often to palace doors, which are, were often large, were big keys. That's why, as I read from Isaiah chapter 22 soon here, you'll see that people wore it around their neck. One example of this was, again, Shebna. Not the, perhaps not a really familiar story to us, <clears throat> but Shebna held the keys to the kingdom of, he, of Hezekiah. He's mentioned in Isaiah chapter 22. That key was a symbol of authority. Shebna, much like the Jewish people from the synagogue of Satan, was prideful. So God took his authority from him and gave it to another man named Eliakim. Here's what we're told in Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 to 22. Tell me if it does not resonate with what we read from Revelation. In that day, 
I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkai, and I will clothe him with your robe, and I will bind your sash on him, and I will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And listen to what he says. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall what? Open. The idea from the book of Revelation, as the book of Isaiah, is the same. God blesses only the faithful and gives legitimate authority only to those who submit to him first and foremost. If you think you can come into God's church with your own agenda and destroy it, you've got a thing coming for you. Christ is the Lord of the church and all authority is his. Amen? Finally, we have three other titles that are given here. And now to this time to the sermon to the church at Laodicea. Revelation 3.14 says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the amen. Come on, you got to give me an amen in church. The words of the amen. amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now the first title here given to Jesus this being described as the amen is, of course, connected to the next title, which means, faith, which means that Jesus is the faithful and true witness. You see, the word amen that we use and we translate as let it be so comes from the root of the word aman in the Hebrew, which means faithful or trustworthy or true. Hence the connection here to Christ being the faithful and true witness. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is faithful? That he is good. Amen. These two titles were a reminder to the church at Laodicea that Christ does not put up, by the way, with cheap fakes. He does not bless the counterfeit. He does not like knockoffs. The believers at Laodicea were lukewarm. Fake believers who are more in love with their sin and wealth than with God. As Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 5, they had an appearance of godliness while denying its power. The final, final title <coughs> to the church at Laodicea points us back to Genesis 2, though. Christ's unique role here in, 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 in the Trinity is fantastic. Jesus is the creator God, as Paul put it. Colossians 1, 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The church at Laodicea, you see, was boastful. And prideful. They boasted in their riches and their prosperity. But compared to Jesus, they had absolutely no reason to be. Jesus is the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. How often do you boast in your riches, your status, your wealth? You see, today's Western church struggles with materialism, with the love of money. Especially in America, just like Laodicea. Love of money, one of our biggest idols today. The church struggles with it. Be warned. You can chase after earthly wealth. It will not satisfy you. That's why we don't buy, pun intended, into the lie of the prosperity gospel. We don't. If you don't know about it, find me afterwards. I'll explain it to you. Now, the second pattern of Christ's sermon, so that's the title that's given. So rich, so much we can still say about it. But then a commendation is often given. Usually, Christ has a commendation to each of the churches, but this is incredible what's happening here. To the church at Sardis in Laodicea, Christ gives no commendation. He goes straight to the complaint that he has against them. The formula is, that's used, I know your works quote, unquote, is followed by a complaint rather than a commendation. Look, listen to what it says. To Sardis, Christ says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Ouch. How can a church have a reputation of being alive, but be dead? I'll get to that in a moment. To Laodicea, Christ says, I know your works. And he goes straight to the complaint. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either cold or 
heart. Now Christ then says, I know your works to the church of Philadelphia, but the tone is much different. The contrast, very different. To Philadelphia, he says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Unlike Laodicea, the church at Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, is poor and insignificant in other people's eyes. You see, God would rather have a poor, small church who is faithful, keeps his word, remains strong in him through adversity, than a church whose building is beautiful, has lots of money and influence, but does not genuinely love him. Though we are enamored with large church buildings, big musical worship platforms, Christian artists that entertain the church with their talent through their shows and multi-million dollar ministries. Jesus is not impressed if it is all for show. Do you know me? It's true. For show. It's true. If it is all for ego boasting, he won't bless it. Now the complaint is given, and again to Sardis, says, I know you work, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. How, again, can be a church, a church be, excuse me, alive but dead easy? They lose sight of the gospel. They can put up a show. They are the trendy church that everyone knows about, but if you look deep into the life of the church, they are unhealthy. I've seen it firsthand. Since there's no complaint about the church of Philadelphia, let's jump to Laodicea. Now the main point here is that Laodicea was boasting about their wealth and their prosperity, but boasting is, use, is useless. Now uh, uh, an illustration of water is used. Uh, my wife and I and our family just went to Colorado. How many of you have been to Colorado? It's incredible. I know some of you have homes there. And uh, in Colorado, we, we uh, you know, we actually went through s- certain rivers, and some rivers are cold. Isn't it nice to go on a long hike and then just jumping into a cold river? Like, we did that several times. In fact, we also took bottles with us, and inside those bottles, there were iced water. And when we were thirsty, after a hike, we drank it. Cold water is very useful. Now, in the same uh, area, in Pagosa Springs, that's where we were, there are hot springs, Right in the middle of town. In fact, people make a business out of it. Warm water is also good. It heals. It does a lot of things. Water, warm water can clean. It's good for drinking tea. And all the other people that drink coffee is going to say amen. And for coffee. All right, drug users. Just kidding, just kidding. Warm water is good. But you see, lukewarm water is neither. It does not satisfy It tastes terrible regardless of what you put in it. You want to spit it out just like Christ said he would do to the church of Laodicea. Lukewarm water is good for nothing. So Christ used the analogy to bring their pride into focus and to warn them to repent of it. And his words to them to repent are just gorgeous. And we'll get to that in just a second. So like a good parent, Jesus will correct the church, and he does. And so the fourth thing that we see is a correction back to the church at Sardis. Notice the repetition of the word name to the church at Sardis. Revelation 3.1, you have a reputation. That's the word onoma in the Greek, the word name of being alive, but you're dead. In Revelation 3.4, you, yet you still have a few names in Sardis. And then Revelation 3.5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his what? Name, and then I will confess his what? Name. So that keeps coming over, come up over and over again. Your name, in terms of your earthly reputation, is not enough, though, to have your name written in the book of life. Many of the names of today's influencers, famous people, sadly, will not be in the book of life. Because they have not repented and turned to Jesus. But if your name is in the book of life, because you indeed have made clear that you have submitted to the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, you can have peace. You can have the assurance that you'll be with Jesus forever. Praise be to God.
Now notice that the correction to the church at Sardis comes through a reminder, to, a reminder of repentance. Jesus tells the church at Sardis the following, remember then what you have received and heard. Listen to what the Spirit has said to the churches. In other words, keep it and repent. I wonder how many of us in here need the same reminder. How easy it is, right, to forget that the gospel calls us to repentance. How easy it is to sit under countless sermons, conferences, life group meetings, classes, and much more to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, but not live it out. It's easy to do. Notice that the words remember, keep, and repent are all active imperative verbs. Don't miss the force of these verbs. Listen to what the Spirit says to the church. Listen to what the Spirit says to you and me. Now, to the church of Laodicea, the one who receives the biggest correction, Jesus is so merciful to. The church of Philadelphia was materially poor, but rich in Christ. The church allowed to see it was materially rich, but poor in Christ. Jesus then tells them that they are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, and that he will vomit them out of, their mouth, uh, out of his mouth. But then he gives them a generous offer. Look at Revelation 3, 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and self to anoint your eyes, so that you may also see. You see, geographically, Laodicea did not have the luxury of the cold waters of Colossae, which was south of, south of them. It also did not have the hot springs of Hierapolis, which was actually north of their location, but they were a wealthy city. They were the Silicon Valley of their day, the Highland Park of their time. They were known for gold. They were known for having Roman officials who actually paraded around wearing white robes, hence the analogy here, those who served the emperor and had influence, and also for being one of the places in the ancient world known for ophthalmology. Hence the mention of self for their eyes. Jesus is so incredibly clever in saying these words to them. Jesus, in other words, is offering them through this heavenly riches. Not earthly riches. That's not what they need. That's not what you need, by the way. He offers them restoration for the shameful, sinful acts by giving them clean white garments and curing them of the blindness of their sin by restoring their spiritual eyesight. Notice the parallels. They are poor, so they're counseled to buy gold refined by fire. They are blind, so they're counseled to buy self to anoint their eyes. They are naked, so they're counseled to buy white garments to clothe themselves and cover their nakedness. He who hears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's what Jesus is counseling them to do. Jesus is a wonderful counselor indeed. So now as we draw to a close, the final pattern we see is a consequence, a negative and a positive one. We begin with the church of Philadelphia. Revelation 3, 12, 13 says, To the one who conquered, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. In my own new name, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, the church at Philadelphia was persecuted. Jeffrey Wayma actually points out, however, that there's a difference between a privileged church and a persecuted church. A persecuted church finds their hope in Jesus alone amidst their trial if they're faithful to him. Not on things, not on their job, not on their riches because often they're poor, often, often they're of low societal status. As we went to Cuba this year, often what our team would say is, man, look at these people. They're so happy and they have nothing. In terms of material possessions, that is. They are not materially privileged. They are persecuted. But if they know God, they are indeed rich. Today in America, we are the materially privileged church. But remember, to whom much is given, much is required. We must not boast in our riches, but rather give it away generously. 
for the cause of the gospel, for the glory of God until his kingdom is fully established. We also must generously give so we may bless our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Now to the negative consequences to Sardis and Laodicea. I mean, Jesus despises sin. I mean, the words that he uses, Revelation 3.3 3 says, If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know in what hour I come against you. You don't want Jesus coming against you. I don't. To Laodicea, you are lukewarm, and I will vomit you. The word that says spit out is vomit you out of my mouth. I don't need to explain much of that. So let me get to the positive consequence. Let me focus on that and then I will end. Notice that Jesus offers, the concrete formula appears, doesn't it, again. I use this word again, the Greek word nikao or nike, where we get the word Nike from the sports company. Again, the implication is if you use Nike equipment that you will win, right? That's true. Maybe the cowboys should, no, I'm just kidding. Now, the conquering is what Jesus desires for us. We're going to begin watching the Olympics soon. You see, back in the day, people weren't given a gold medal. They were given a crown called a Stephanos, which was more like a, a wreath that was a reward for their winning efforts. Jesus is actually, he says this through the church of Philadelphia, and people were trying to take that away from them in Revelation 3.11. See, Christ will crown us with glory when we cross the finish line if we remain faithful to him. You can choose to be a victorious Christ follower or a defeated loser. That's your choice. God wants to crown you with this Stephanos crown of glory and victory at the end of the earthly race of your endurance for the glory of his name. Not for yours, but for his so I pray that you and I will heed the words that Jesus said. Notice this, and I'll read these words, these words and I'll, I'll end. Revelation 3, chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. Has the first person, person plural, uh, excuse me, singular pronoun used over and over again. I, 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 me, me, me. That's how graceful Jesus is. Don't miss that. Jesus himself is saying this. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me me on my throne and I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Praise be to you, Jesus, for your mercy towards us. May God have mercy on our souls. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, let's pray. Jesus, your word is so rich, so beautiful. It's like a treasure box we can keep digging and finding things and learning about it. But if we look into it and add it, if we hear its words spoken out loud and do not repent and truly listen, we know, Lord, that we will be missing out on your blessings. and that we will remain in our sin. May it not be so. Thank you for warning us today, instructing us in love, and blessing us for the glory of your name, for there is no higher purpose.